Hey there, Culture Gab Fest listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI and stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. I'm Stephen Metcalf, and this is the Slate Culture Gap Fest JLo. This is the What Now edition. It's Wednesday, February 28th. 2024 on today's show. This is me now. A love story is a, well, no one quite knows what it is. There are many very funny descriptions of what it might be out there. Uh, For now, let's say it's a companion film to Jennifer Lopez's new album. To help make sense of this project, we're joined by Wesley Morris, of course, the critic at large for the New York Times and very old friend of this program. And then video reporters for the Associated Press documented the siege and eventual destruction of a Ukrainian city. Their footage now makes up the documentary 20 Days in Mariupol, nominated for Best Feature Documentary at the Oscars. And finally, the freaks came out to write the definitive history of the Village Voice, the radical paper that changed American culture. It's an oral history of the first and, to my mind, still greatest alternative newspaper of all time, the Village Voice. Joining me today is Julia Turner, the senior fellow at the USC Annenberg Journalism School. Julia, hey. Hello, hello. And of course, Dana Stevens is the film critic for Slate. Hey, Dana. Hello, hello. All right. Well, here is what we can say for sure. This Is Me Now, A Love Story is a companion film to Jennifer Lopez's ninth studio album, and it's available for viewing on Amazon Prime. Beyond that, it's kind of up for grabs. This is a self-funded $20 million, what's it, vanity project. It definitely stars Jennifer Lopez as, I guess, herself or not at all disguised alter ego. She conceived and co-wrote it. And it begins with a busily animated sequence recounting a Puerto Rican myth of two lovers transformed respectively into a hummingbird and a rose. And here, I just have to immediately see to the language of our guest, Wesley Morris. Wesley, welcome back to the show. You are, of course, the critic at large for the New York Times and co-host of the Still Processing podcast. It's great to see you and great to have you back. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you guys. Uh, it's nice really to hear nice. You, Julia. Before we get to Wesley, let's listen to a clip from it. In it, Lopez muses to a new lover that they are a match ordained by the stars only for him to snap and turn suddenly violent. It's one of a string of ill-advised dalliances. Let's listen. The signs say we're a match. That's you, Libra. And? And? Your meticulousness keeps me focused. I'm meticulous. <laughs> yeah, you know, you... You can be particular. How do you listen to that crap? Baby, what? It's a compliment. It just means that you like everything perfect. Perfect? Hey, is this perfect? Ow! Is this perfect, it's huh? Two, stop! It's about what? Uh, huh? Damn! Why do you always make me do this? We don't have to lie. Damn, sorry. We know this is wrong. Someone on my mind got someone on my phone. If we gonna <sighs> I mean Oh yes, geez. the domestic violence montage. Uh, you have to picture all that taking it, place in a, a see-through high-rise. It's, it's a glass, glass house. house. <laughs> it's a glass. It's a glass house, and it's a glass dollhouse in which J Lo, like the other six couples in the glass dollhouse, are enacting the violent and sadistic relationship through dance. But hers is the only one whose kink is re- like the, it's not kink; it's actual domestic violence. Whereas the other couples seem to be like it seems to be part of their their erotic 
Yes, I think, I think to, the best way to explain what this film is, is the bit of confused analysis you just heard of that 15 seconds of film <laughs> you could do for every single 15 yeah. seconds of film that there is. Like, yes. it yes. starts yes. in this steampunk factory where a gigantic steampunk heart is collapsing and spewing smoke. This is not a drill. Report to the lower chamber. And JLo is kind of doing steelworker chic because of the existential problem of the quote pedal levels being low, which is some kind of metaphor. It's gonna break. <laughs> it's actually a readout that says pedal levels low. No, there's like a dial. There's like a dial, a steampunk dial that goes into the red, which signifies low pedal levels, which is, I guess, how you feel when you're no longer capable of love because of your crisis of fame. Pedal supply fully depleted. Do not evacuate. There's nothing left. They're all dead. And then there's so much <laughs> dancing, much of it good. My favorite number was... Is it though? Go on. Well, I want to get actually back to the to the Gene Kelly homage at the end, but which there is also. Uh, she does a singing in the rain number that is incredibly labored, which is the exact opposite of what makes mm -hmm. the the original singing in the rain what it is. But a lot of the dancing is quite good. There's literally like a love addicts encounter group dance session with chairs that I think also she's doing. It's sign language dance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Did you catch mm -hmm, that? Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. and then Paul Racy from the from the Sound of Metal. Is the leads the Love yes. Addicts Anonymous yes. group where the chair dancing montage takes place? We're gonna see you again next week. I know you feel like nobody gets you. I don't even get me <laughs> because he's your go to hard Just one let, wisdom yes. mentor guy. Exactly, exactly. Just pop him right in there. There's also a wonderful, I really enjoyed the the wedding song where she <laughs> has three that, that is like her three simultaneous weddings in a row. You may now kiss the bride. Doing it. I just want to. I just feel like I bet you she thinks the rain's a sign. Oh my god, stop. I just ooh, hey. I feel like starting something. It's the only inspired moment in the movie to me, honestly. That that sequence is pretty good. Let's do that for the newlyweds. It's their first dance, y'all. Double or nothing. I love it. And one of the grooms is, I think, Derek Howe or Huff, or I don't know how to say yes. it, people's last Huff, name, Huff. from Dancing with the Stars, which yes. allows the viewer to fantasize what if J-Lo did f Dancing with the Stars for, for, you know, 15 seconds of that, which is a, a great number. Third time's a charm. You want to bet? Touch and tease it. So good, I can't believe it. My main thing I want to take up with you, Wesley, this is so bizarre. And it is so enjoyable by dint of its mm -hmm. like deeply vulnerable bizarreness that I came away from my watching experience feeling extremely warmly toward it and her. And typically when I am emotionally moved by something and then I read what you've written about it, I think, ah, thank God. Now Wesley said everything I thought so I know what I think and I can rest my, my weary brain. In this instance, I felt like your review of this in it, you were kind of like the stern teacher I didn't want to listen to because you <laughs> identify in this film an abiding, deep, yearning, striving, hustling, restless sadness in J-Lo. And I wanted to buy into her storyline that now she's finally happy hmm. and you're kind of calling her on the bullshit and i think you're right but i'm so bummed because i was so charmed by how absolutely fucking kookaloo this thing is. <laughs> i mean dana i, I, I mean i'm gonna, gonna offer a counterpoint here I, okay. I don't know i mean i keep I, a lot of what we read in our in, in our prep doc reading you know people's reactions to this including N nadira goff at slate we're sort of saying essentially what julia just said like this is so endearing in its narcissism I felt like I liked J-Lo less after watching it. Mm -hmm. I did not mm -hmm. dislike her. I don't disrespect her. I don't think that she doesn't have, you know, gifts and, and things to give the world. But to spend $20 million out of your own pocket and make all of these decisions, I kept thinking, 
I kept sort of retconning the production moment, you know, the moment mm. when she's sitting mm-hmm. down in production mm-hmm. meetings, you know, wearing sweats with her hair in a messy bun. <laughs> and she's talking with the production designer who's, you know, making the, the digital pedals or whatever it is. She's making craftspeople create all these things, right? I mean, it's a very expensive looking piece of, of For the most whatever part, it yes, is, right? Yes, yes, yes. And it felt extremely um, blinkered to me. You know, it didn't feel vulnerable in a way because because there's not a single moment. Yes, there's, you know, hugging your inner child. There's, you know, an, an encounter group dance scene and all of these things that are sort of performing vulnerability. But there's certainly never a moment where she doesn't look beautiful, where she doesn't, you know, dance in a sexy way, where everything surrounding her is not impossibly glossy and luxurious to like an absurd campy degree. And the, the moment that always sticks with me is her throwing her old love letter into the fire while wearing this sort of like <laughs> coral gauze nightgown that's about 20 feet long with a train perfectly arranged around her. You know, that's very much the vibe of this show. So, I mean, at the same time, it's sort of goofily campy and enjoyable, and it seems like she must have had fun doing the design work, but it just seems like there's a lot of throwing a ton of money and design and yeah. luxury and compensation at this supposed hole in her heart that mm. she's singing about. Mm-hmm. Right, and it's not fun to watch mm-hmm. really i mean it, I the, first I, I hear that. you know your irony comes between you know you and it and then the fun can be had but i you can't you never you never are lost in it it has no flow it's frenetically visual and what it's supposed to add up to is a parable of her finding mental and spiritual health and it seems to me what she's offering is evidence is okay as you say i think you diagnose it correctly right she has these proliferated selves because she got famous incredibly young and has stayed globally famous ever since you know you are sort of being like manatically torn apart and consumed by the whole world all the time and maybe whatever core might have developed there never had a chance there's a real pathos to that and additionally you're a love addict right you serially monogamously go from guy to guy thinking they are quote unquote the one hence the hummingbird parable And as two bits of evidence, you offer, A, this film, the most fragmented, fractured, (laughs) incoherent, you know, piece of non-narrative. And self-flattering. I mean, let's be honest. It's very self-flattering. Enormously self-flattering. And second, and the second piece of evidence, and I got back together with Ben Affleck. And you're like, I don't think this is going to age well, but I mean, more power to them. I literally, I hope they are buried side by side and for all of eternity hold hands. But I mean, it just has the feeling of a person saying, I'm cured, I'm better, look, I'm better. And in the way they say it and the tone and the neediness with which they say it, they heartbreakingly demonstrate to you that they're not. Well, I actually think, I mean, to all of your points, because I agree with with all three of you, actually, Julia, I think the thing for me about the pleasure that you're able to take in in her self-presentation is for me the, I wanted to feel that except I also feel like there's a way in which the meaning of this whole thing has just gotten away from her and it isn't about vulnerability to me it's about exposure right I feel like this is a person who has exposed herself and she she doesn't even know that how this looks right this is different from like the misogynistic attacks against women who have visions for themselves and express them through art it's not what we say about a barbara streisand or i mean to some very different extent a beyonce this to me is i mean i truly i mean she puts herself in a therapist's office for four scenes you know, and she doesn't get like a the therapist is played by Fat Joe. We should also just stipulate. <laughs> I was going to say, like, it's not Eliana Van Zant. It's not. Do you know what I mean? It's not somebody who it's not. It's not Fraser Crane. even, <laughs> Right. <laughs> it's the guy. Who Although, said, like, it definitely could be. Right. But I mean, <laughs> Fat, Fat Joe is looking good. But I mean, this is a guy who gave us the immortal line, Jenny, you the bomb. But I think she. It, it, in the way that we're sort of thinking about what was it like to like look at the pedal designs and like look at the sets and like work out the choreography and how are we going to move our bodies and wouldn't it be great if this if this you know encounter session at the Love Addicts Anonymous th- session was actually done in American Sign Language and 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 but was there ever a moment where somebody said hey 
hey, Jen. Mm -hmm. This is Um, what I'm saying. Her loved ones need to speak to her. (laughs) An intervention, yeah. No, but I mean, but I would would be like, I wouldn't be like, are you sure you want to spend $20 million on this? I'm like, I would, the question is, do you know what you're saying with this project? Do you know how it how it looks not like you're making a fool of yourself but there's something really deep underneath this and you're presenting it to people like me who enjoy studying the work of artists of all kinds and what i'm seeing is a continuation of a thing that began when she was a fly girl right all of that work and energy and drive and commitment and determination. And one person in my life texted me that, you know, the thing that Miss Lopez has sort of misunderstood or it's not that she's even misunderstood it. Like the, the, the priority that she makes of being such a hard worker is in her mind, perhaps the thing that should make her also the best because she's not the greatest singer you're ever going to hear. She is not the greatest dancer you're ever going to see, nor is she the greatest actress you're ever going to experience. But I don't know anybody who works as hard as Jennifer Lopez at being who they are. And I think that showing you the work, the labor, I mean, having herself be an actual laborer in this thing, like working this fact, this love factory. It's such an admission of something that I don't even know she knows she's admitting, right? But the idea that she's presenting herself as a laborer (laughs) for love. Yeah, I mean, that's why I was so depressed to find your argument persuasive, Wesley, (laughs) because, which I usually I'm not depressed when I find it persuasive. Because I want, I want her to be happy, but it is true. I know from, you know, every, we all know from the people in our lives who are struggling with things. It's like the moment when you are truly healed is not the moment where you're like, look, 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 I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. Mm -hmm. You know, like it has to be quieter. Mm -hmm. It has to be in yourself and not for anybody else but you. But I'm rooting for this girl. (laughs) We've been rooting for 30 years. That's the thing. Like, I like this person. <laughs> All right, Wesley. Well, as always, it's so amazing having you on the show to talk. I wish we could do it more often. Thanks for coming I love in. you guys. And, uh, you know, I mean, every time I'm listening to this show, I'm like, ah! <laughs> I love it. And then I get listen. to come into the studio and I'm I get to I get to do it in your faces. I'm gonna up my game knowing that you're listening. I know. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> All right, well, it's This Is Me, dot, 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 now, a love story. It's a Jennifer Lopez joint. It's on Amazon Prime. Check it out. All right, Dana, before we go any further, this is typically where we discuss business. What do we have today? Steve, we have two items of business today. The first one is really small. It's just a correction of something I said on a show a few weeks ago, back before I went on vacation. We were talking about True Detective on HBO, and I mentioned Fiona Shaw, who is really wonderful in a secondary role in that show, and I called her an English or British actress. I should never speak about the nationality of anyone from the islands in that part of the world because I always get it wrong, but an Irish listener very kindly wrote in to politely tell me that she is, in fact, an Irish woman. She is often doing a British accent or playing an English person. Uh, She's actually playing an American in True Detective. But yes, Fiona Shaw, the great, hails from the land of Ireland. Our only other item of business this week is to tell you about our Slate Plus segment this week, which is kind of a surprise. It surprised us as well. We had a different plan for Slate Plus. But when Wesley Morris, beloved longtime friend of the program and New York Times writer and podcaster, came in to talk to us about the J-Lo autobiographical movie, which we'll get to later, we ended up having this really, really fun conversation accidentally on mic before we started taping, where Wesley, who is a big listener to our show, asked us about uh, a previous topic we talked about. We started getting into talking about that movie. Then we asked him about a movie. Next thing you know, we're just kind of chopping it up with Wesley. And it was such a good conversation that we thought we would include that bonus material as a plus. If you belong to Slate Plus, you will hear that at the end of our show. If you don't, you should become a member by going to slate.com slash culture plus. When you do, you get ad-free podcasts. You get 
unlimited access to all of the writing and podcasting on Slate so that you never hit a paywall. And you hear special segments like the one I just described with Wesley Morris. These memberships are really what helps keep us going. So please sign up today at slate.com slash culture plus. Actually, Dana, can I add one more piece of business to the agenda? Sure, sure. Jump in. So every couple of years, we like to ask our listeners to do a little evangelism for our show. We marked it fairly quietly, but last year was actually our 15th year doing the show. So we are barreling towards our 16th anniversary, which in the dog years of podcasting, I can't wait for the oral history of the culture gab fest and how we invented the culture chat show and, um, you know, exactly what Norman Miller said to who and who he nearly murdered while we did it. But, you know, it's been a, it's been a quieter history. But nonetheless, we are still so grateful to be able to yak it up every week and to speak about culture and have listeners like you and listeners like Wesley Morris. And we would love for you to evangelize for us. So please, if you are a fan of this show, tell a friend, download it on somebody else's podcast app and get them to listen. It's still very helpful if you like our show or leave a comment on the various apps you listen on. There are a lot of shows I will point out that every week say, don't forget to like and subscribe on blah, 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 blah. We do not say that to you every week because we know it will become white noise and you will ignore us. Instead, we lie in wait. And every 18 to 30 months, we say now, now is the moment. So now, now is the moment. Please go give a give a couple positive signals to the algorithm if you're a fan of the show. We would just love to find a few new listeners at this moment of podcast history as people seem to be kind of re-engaging with the medium. So if you like us, share. Thanks. Tired of not being able to get a hold of anyone when you have questions about your credit card? With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service from Discover, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yes, you heard that right. You can talk to a human on the Discover customer service team anytime. So the next time you have a question about your credit card, call 1-800-DISCOVER to get the service you deserve. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, as our company expands, so do our hiring efforts. How can AI help us attract top talent? Signed, Searching for Higher Power. So, Searching for Higher Power, one of the most daunting undertakings of an HR leader today is building a new team and finding and vetting new talent. This is a very time-consuming process and can take precious organizational resources. As a companion to the HR team, AI technology can be used to create job descriptions, analyze candidate resumes, and filter candidates into various pools based on experience, skills, or any other parameter. You can also use AI to match internal talent with positions available. Parameters for this can be set, rules can be set, that can all be done through the algorithm. There are so many things that we as humans could be not looking at that AI can do in a matter of seconds. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. The first 20 days of the Russian invasion of Ukraine was devoted in no small part to capturing the city of Mariupol, a strategically critical port city in Ukraine. The documentary 20 Days in Mariupol begins with a normal, pacific, seemingly high-functioning metropolis. Then there are some rumors, a frenetic but only partial evacuation, a plume of smoke on the horizon. And then what can one even say? You end up by the end of the film with mass graves in a wasteland of rubble. The film is stitched together from hours of video footage taken by an AP video journalist and his two colleagues, and it documents up close and gruesomely one atrocity after another, most infamously the bombing of a maternity ward along the way to trying to counter the mind-bending propaganda campaign by Putin to cover up his true aims and methods. 
It's been nominated for the uh, Academy Award for Best Feature Documentary. In the clip, we're going to be brought inside a hospital in the besieged city where exhausted doctors and staff fend off despair as supplies run desperately low. Let's listen. Patients are moved away from the windows. And day after day, the conditions in the hospital get worse. This is one of the boys who was hit while playing soccer. Doctors smile at him, but I hear a whisper that his leg may need to be amputated. There are almost no antibiotics left to stop the sepsis. Dana, I think we felt strongly that we had to do it, not simply because it was nominated for this award, but there's a compelling moral reason to watch it and try to understand what's going on on the ground in Ukraine. At the same time, one would be reluctant to insist that someone see it. It's, I think it's the single most difficult thing I've ever watched on film in my life. I can't think of anything that approaches its horrors. It's unflinching. Let's start there. What do you make of this? Yeah, like a lot of people, and maybe like you too as well, I've been putting off watching this movie all year. I've been hearing about how this was an extraordinary documentary, you know, from the moment it, it started to premiere at festivals. It's now the front runner to win Best Documentary at the Oscars, which is part of why we're talking about it, because we haven't really covered that category. But it also occupies this entirely different category of, as you say, Steve, things that you really should watch just because they are the truth. They are about something that's happening that is easy to turn away from because it's so hard to experience. And the question of what this footage is for is is very central to the documentary itself. The question of how to watch, how not to look away, what this footage means and who it helps that it exists in the world. And, uh, and that was what I hadn't expected so much, I don't think, is that it is not just raw footage from a war zone, but it is very much a, a film about how information is transmitted, right, from from a place where on the ground suffering is happening to a place where people in more comfortable settings or, you know, far across the globe can encounter it. And there's a lot of footage in this documentary that you see twice, right? Like the maternity hospital, we see the the actual sort of real-time raw footage on the ground of them running. I mean, it makes you think about handheld camera in a whole different way to watch a movie where people are running for their lives as they're taking the footage, right? So we see it sort of being coming together on the ground. And then later on, we see the parts of that, you know, the few little moments, the few shots that make it onto through the AP wire, that it make it onto the news around the world, uh, everywhere except in Russia, it seems, right? You see them on the Australian news and the Japanese news and the American news. And you see that it's been reduced, yes, to, to sort of a small bite of what it was, right? But it also is being transmitted in some in some way. And a big part also of the, the drama, the action of this movie is them attempting to get the footage out. So in addition to filming it, there's these moments where they're going through a city where communications have been cut off, there isn't any internet, there isn't any electricity, and, uh, and trying to find a way to get enough of a signal that they can at least send a little bit of footage out to the world. So this is not just a documentary about civilians in warfare, which is almost exclusively what they film, right? We don't really see soldiers fighting. There's a few Ukrainian soldiers who are sort of herding people around once in a while. But what you're really seeing is absolutely innocent, you know, women, children, families being bombarded. But we're also talking about information channels in the 21st century, right? So I, I just was I was astounded at how much was going on, how much thinking was going on, yeah. in addition to, you know, all the feeling that's going on as you watch these images. Well, I also think your use of the word unflinching is really interesting, Dana, because it is unflinching. But I think sometimes when you see an unflinching documentary, there's almost a defiance about it. Like, look what I looked at. You got to look at it, too. And one of the things I really admired about this documentary is that there is great sympathy for the impulse to flinch within it and great kind of grief and curiosity about what is the point and value of capturing this terrifying and awful material. Like the humanity of the work really comes through and is part of why I would encourage people to find the time to watch this, even though it is so grim it's not just because it is grim, which I think is sometimes the answer, like because it is grim and it is our responsibility to look at the grimness of the world. I was struck so often by the surrealism in 
the footage by the human instinct. I think the film is very attentive to the human instinct to kind of not even be able to process atrocity this awful, to want to believe that it is okay, to assure each other it is okay in moments where it is very definitely not as both uh, an important human defense mechanism, but also a kind of awful denial. The film opens with the journalists encountering a distraught woman on the street and telling her, go home, you'll be safe in your basement, they're not going to bomb civilians. And then hours later, the Russians have. And so that the film is just very curious about that instinct to flinch, that instinct to look away, the instinct to just tell yourself things will be okay, must be okay. And kind of the incapacity of human experience to even process something this awful. And then I think also an inquiry about the value of journalism, right? And like, what is even the point of documenting this and getting it out in a world where, you know, the Russians will dismiss it as sort of crisis actor propaganda and sort of say, oh, no, we never bombed that maternity hospital. Those pregnant people were not blown to bits. Those babies didn't die. This is all fake. Like, it, it it's just heart wrenching, um, but just so wise is very wise in a way that I was astounded by. Yeah, I I, I totally concur with what both of you said. I it's a movie that at first you aren't sure you there's nothing prurient about it, nothing aestheticized. A lot of privacy given to the victims who were filmed too, in terms of not showing their faces. But that's true. But one should also say. A sense of violating privacy, even if there was consent or even if the face is blurred. I've never seen things like this filmed, right? I mean, I I can't even speak them out loud. They're so just utterly horrifying. And to see it, I mean, it's a really elemental human instinct, right? Like, there's a reason we have these elaborate rituals around the dead, the covering a body with the sheet, right? The idea that you bury ritualistically and memorialize the dead in these highly rit- ritualistic ways. A corpse is not an object among other objects in the world. It's an, it's in the measure between what a living person is and a dead person is all that we actually are and can't quite name or fully understand. You know, consciousness and life themselves have left the physical thing, leaving us with this object that we treat with a kind of reverence and to not treat it with reverence as the Russians are in some sense, right? Not only killing, but then creating a world in which mass graves are the way some of these people meet their final resting place it is a desecration, right? To not treat a corpse with a reverence is like a deeply human violation of our values. It's evil. And so violating them with the camera lens is not not an issue, right? There's a reason why things like this have never appeared in front of your eyes before on a screen. The film makes the case, I think, actually the film doesn't make the case. The film allows Ukrainians to make the case that this has to be filmed. Principally, two people stand out. There's a doctor who very early on is, you're literally watching him lose a innocent person's life. He can't save it. And he just turns and he says, film this, film this, show that fucker Putin what he's doing, show the world what that fucker is doing to us. And at that moment, whatever, I mean, personally, I can only speak for me, whatever qualm I had watching the movie was totally gone. And the second character is this kind of amazing Ukrainian cop, I think he is. He's a police officer who's just trying to maintain some degree of order and safety, realizing understanding, knowing ahead of time what the Russian propaganda, black is white, white is black, Russian propaganda campaign is going to be like, knows how important it is to escort this team to some one spot in the entire city that still has something like a SAT connection or an internet connection or whatever it is in order to get, they can only upload like 10 seconds at a time, but literally the war can be won and lost, right? Like the U.S. Congress that might have some isolationist or pro-Putin sentiment in it that might forestall funding, right? Like that backbone could just melt away in a world where Tucker Carlson has, you know, the ear of red state America to have these images in front of people. So the double think, double speak campaign of Putin and his flunkies doesn't take root, even in the right wing mind in America. That was huge to have that happen. And so the film without being 
aggressive about it makes the case that you ought to watch. And the final thing I'll just say is that this is a profoundly non-narrative and and unaestheticized experience to watch this. And it just reminds us, you know, how much violence we consume in media that's narrativized in a way that things turn out okay. Like there's some redemptive aspect to violence and aestheticized. It doesn't actually, re- that's not what violence looks like. This kind of bing, bing, bing. It's almost like little kids with finger guns in movies, you know, and it, I hate to say it, there's just something healthy about remembering that violence is an ultimately ugly act and there's no reducing that. Right. I mean, which is why this this movie makes you think about war as an abstract yes. concept and not only about this particular war. Yeah, so, right, it's Gaza. I mean, it's any place that civilians are dying on the ground. So there's a sense of real moral urgency to watching it where you feel like, how could this ever have been allowed to happen anywhere in human history, much less be happening constantly all over the world for as long as there has been humanity? Yeah. And I think part of the grief of it is, you know, it, it has not been effective, right? We, ha- we have not authorized the funding. And the filmers understand that getting the images out won't necessarily change the course of anything. And, and the director speaks about having shot, you know, every atrocity Russia has committed in the last 10 years, which is many. And so I, I felt really affected by the juxtaposition of the raw footage they've shot, where you get a little sense of the heartbreaking stories of these people and how they are then presented on cable news, which is both a victory and the goal and the thing they are fighting for in this documentary, right? To get the footage out, to prove that this bombing of the maternity ward happened, to then go at great personal risk to the hospital where some of those victims were moved to then either have their babies or not. Um, And there's a truly astounding scene that made me weep when we get to the hospital, which I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about and I won't spoil here. But, you know, to to then go follow up, to follow these victims, to prove to the people it might need to be proved to, although they won't be provable to them, that these were not, in fact, actors pretending to be in a bombed maternity hospital. And that just the fact that getting your kind of two second clip on cable news is the kind of victory they are fighting for in this information war and seeing how reduced those images are, even though, of course, it was astounding in the early days of the war to to have this record of the civilian attack and casualty. You know, it's like, are you even turning into cable news? When you turn into cable news, how reduced is that like little snippet that's just proof that bad thing happened, but doesn't quite open you up to the experience of the atrocity in the same way. And even that achievement of getting it into cable news is is decreasingly something that can change minds or change policy. Like the futility of it is just bleak, even in this very, the context of this very wrenching and human film. It's very true. So this is just, it's, we're in an odd position where one wants to urge people to watch 20 Days in Mariupol and it's streaming now, it's on Amazon. At the same time, people have to know what they're encountering going in. So you just have to be prepared to pause it, uh, turn it off maybe, walk away. It's, It's very intense, but you have to be prepared to see violence against civilian innocence at an extreme level without it cutting away for your benefit the viewers immediate benefit so i think we all agree one ought to see this if one can do it and anyway let's move on this podcast is brought to you by progressive insurance whether you're driving cooking or doing laundry progressive knows the podcast you listen to go best when they're bundled with another activity much like how their progressive home and auto policies go best when they're bundled having these two policies together makes taking care of your insurance easier and could help you save too Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. That's a whole lot of savings and protection for your favorite podcast listening activities, like going on a road trip, cooking dinner, even hitting the home gym. Yep, your home and your car are even easier to protect when you bundle your insurance together. Find your perfect combo. Get a home and car insurance quote at Progressive.com today. 
Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Tell me about your mama's kitchen. That simple request opens up a flood of delicious memories, and it's at the center of the Audible original podcast, Your Mama's Kitchen. On Your Mama's Kitchen, host Michelle Norris talks to guests like Michelle Obama, Glennon Doyle, Leslie Jones, Matthew McConaughey, and more about how their earliest culinary experiences helped shape their personal and professional lives. And of course, each guest brings a recipe for a favorite dish from their youth so you can taste a bit of their story. It's a show about cuisine and culture, ingredients and identities, and the meals and memories that make us who we are. Find Your Mama's Kitchen anywhere you listen. All right. Well, The Village Voice is the great alt-weekly newspaper, of course. It was started by, among others, Norman Mailer, two others, in the mid-1950s. It's still the original and great flagship alt-weekly. And there's a new oral history of it. It's called The Freaks Came Out to Write, The Definitive History of the Village Voice, The Radical Paper That Changed American Culture. It's uh, 200 interviews with, you name it, writers, editors, photographers, cartoonists compiled by uh, Trisha Romano, who worked at The Voice uh, in its later phase. Julia, let me start with you. I mean, Colson Whitehead, Jack Newfield, uh, Wayne Barrett, Vivian Gornick, Greg Tay, Jules Pfeiffer. I mean, on and on and on. This newspaper just launched so many huge journalistic careers. It occupied such a dominant space in the consciousness of left or counterculture America, though it was even more than that and more expansive than that. What was your experience of The Voice growing up? I'm really curious what it meant to you just as a kid. Like, you know, was it a revelation to encounter it? And what does it mean retrospectively now that you're an editor with uh, a lot of experience making things like it? Well, it's so interesting because I think psychically I'm an all-weekly kid, even though I was not like a voice reader and, you know, I was not like subscribing from Massachusetts, like the the kind of New York magazine and publication culture that made its way to me as a child. The little pockets of windows into worlds of sensibility were, you know, Sassy Magazine, which was a formative kind of indie rock teen magazine in the 90s. I also read Bonfire of the Vanities around this time. So I had like a very kind of funny sense, I think, of what 80s New York was as a child. So I was not, I did not grow up a voice reader. But somehow in the course of my journalistic career, I've like ended up at places with all weekly sensibilities. Like there were two newspapers in my high school, the Broadsheet and the Raffish Weekly. And I worked at the Raffish Weekly. And then there were two newspapers in my college, the Brown Daily Herald and the College Hill Independent. And I ended up editing the Raffish Weekly College Hill Independent. And then, you know, Slate is an internet magazine, but it certainly had some sensibility of a, you know, sardonic person leaning in the corner and kind of poking at the straight news coming at it sideways and with an angle and with a twist. So I feel like the Village Voice created the journalistic water I've swum in my whole life, but I have not actually spent a ton of time with it as an object. And by the time I moved to New York, it was not the primary interpreter of New York for me, which is part of what makes this book, which is very lively and really well constructed as an oral history. There are taut, tight, well-paced, exciting ways to make an oral history. And there are sloppy, lazy, I didn't really feel like writing today ways to make an oral history. And this is definitely firmly in the first bucket, I think. Curious to hear what you guys think of just being like a real achievement of thinking and editing in a way that I admire. So it's just fun. It's like going to the source. So I'm enjoying it, but kind of as a a reveal of the origin and a look at the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. But I'm curious for you guys who I imagine having arrived in New York earlier than I maybe had different relationships with the paper. Julia, actually, I think, although I'm a bit older than you, we probably started our lives and our professional lives in New York at around the same time. The Voice was free in boxes by the time I got here. It was not the only alt-weekly, right? I mean, it was the time where there was also the New York Press and probably other alt-weeklies, too. It was kind of the the heyday of the free alt-weekly, very, very early 21st century. And what really struck me reading these great testimonials from, you know, all the the great veterans that Trisha Romano interviewed is how storied that history was and how the voice just seemed like it would always be there. You Mm -hmm. know, I mean, even more so than than many other papers, I think it seemed like it was this. Yeah, just this sort of um, 
temple of Bohemia, <laughs> you know, yeah. that would always be there. There would always be some incredibly long reported story about, you know, landlord malfeasance that you couldn't finish because it was 10,000 words long. And then there would be a bunch of really raunchy sex ads in the back. And what else was always in there? There'd be always be a piece of very highbrow film criticism, right? I mean, Andrew Saris wrote for The Voice for many, many years. Yeah, Hoberman. But even, and yeah. Jay Hoberman. But even after they were gone, you know, Michael Atkinson, I think, mm-hmm. still writes for The Voice website. You know, it was a particular flavor of film criticism that was, you know, just sort of snobbish, right? I mean, just sort of assuming that, like, of course, the big popular movie is you know, of the week is completely worthy of disdain. But maybe there's a sort of Marxist counter reading of it that could be interesting. Anyway, I mean... All I can say about the voice is that even if it wasn't something that I grabbed and read every week, there was just the sense that it was this, I don't know, this this staple of, of New York life. And it, it's, it's, there's really a sense reading this um, of, of what disappeared when it disappeared. But Steve, what about you? you? You probably did grow up reading The Voice. I did. Yeah. No, it was it was it was funny. Even though I was growing up in New York City, I was growing up in a starchy, waspy, in its own weird way, provincial corner of it. So it was still a missive from another planet and one that I was profoundly grateful for. I think it was Jack Newfeld or someone associated with it said, yeah, the thing about the voice is like 50% of it's great, 50% of it's awful. And no one can agree which 50% is which, right? It's like there was something in there for everybody. We use words like left or or socialistic or countercultural or whatever, but the but oral history demonstrates an enormous pride even people who fit that description took in writing for a paper that also had fr- very frankly conservative voices writing in it. It was a real grab bag and people were allowed to fight one another. So backing up a little bit and pulling out a little bit, it's sort of a – you could almost argue it's like that that paper was the product of two wars, right? It was started by three World War II veterans who moved to New York City in the, in the, in, after the war in 46, Mailer being the – famous one, but two friends of his. And they brought that ethos, right, of like, okay, well, it's a whole new world. Like there is, we forget this, right? But there was a tabula rasa in the the post-war period where like everything kind of failed and then there was the depression and now we're finally out of the depression. The good times are back. There's some degree of affluence. And New York was really reinvented in that period. That period, that's the city where Andy Warhol moves here from Pittsburgh and becomes like a young, aspiring graphic designer for ads. I mean, that was a really percolating city that was discovering a completely new identity. And The Voice was part of that, started in 1955, okay? So this this paper, in the height of what is thought of now as conformist America, Eisenhower America, so it predates so much of what we, or let me put it this way, I'll put it even stronger. It's not only that it predates so much of the signifiers that we use to describe what it was. Right. It wasn't a hippie paper to begin with. No. Right? It, was a, it was a beat paper. It was sort of a beat paper, but what it, above all, I think what it did is it invented the city we now all live in. It invented the imaginative community of a city whose bohemianness is, a, even as when it's opposed, is a sort of essential to its identity and sense of itself. And it, it traces the arc of that going from a minority sensibility to the default sensibility. I mean, oligarchs with a trillion dollars in the bank moved to the city in part because of the city, the voice in some sense. In other words, I think the paradigm of urbanity that we all feed off of now that created Soho. I mean, the paper literally saved the neighborhood of Soho by reporting on Robert Moses's plans for it in conjunction with Jane Jacobs, who's now credited with saving it from a giant superhighway that would have bifurcated lower Manhattan and destroyed it as we know it. It allowed Soho to thrive. It allowed downtown Manhattan to become the thing that we coherently think of as like you know, Greenwich Village, which has now moved on to Brooklyn, to Bushwick, and further out and further out, and then went global. So it's an entire consciousness of how to be in a a modern urbanite. And I think it was a victim of its own success in some sense. And then, of course, so many of the energies transferred to the internet, just personality-driven writing by people whose barrier to entry into the "Quote unquote profession of being a journalist or a critic is is nil. I mean, it's not even said high, and um, it lost its business model and its uniqueness, and it unfortunately has all but disappeared." Yeah, I love what you guys are saying about how a publication can kind of create a sense of a sensibility of a city, and it's been really interesting to think about that in in beginning to look from more of an academic lens at the Los Angeles media landscape, which over the years 
you know, it used to have the Herald Examiner, a kind of lefty artsy hippie newspaper. There was a period when LA Weekly was the robust all weekly voice out here. And it is now sort of a zombified version of itself. Uh, you know, Los Angeles Magazine is also kind of a hollowed out zombie version of itself. Like the and, and Los Angeles is a city with so many identities and such a mosaic of identities that the role that a publication can play in kind of articulating a sensibility and a sense of place and self and community is really interesting to think through because it's there in the name, right? It's the village voice. It used this particular place within New York as almost an avatar for a sensibility that that came to represent New York as an idea. And it's interesting to think about that from the vantage point of Los Angeles, which is so sprawling and kind of the point of it is that there is no center and that everybody has their own little version of it. But I'm loving this book. It's a tome, but it's a really sprightly tome if such a thing can exist. And if if this subject is of interest to our readers, I would really, our listeners, I would send them to it. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would, I would maybe add to our whole discussion is that the book doesn't sound like we sound right now. It's not an abstract analysis of journalism's past and future. It's really, really colorful, funny, sexy, weird. It's just a history of a whole bunch of very quirky writers trying to inhabit this really cramped (laughs) office. It's just, it's a really, really good oral history in terms of giving you the texture of a time and a place and a a scene. All right. Well, the book is The Freaks Came Out to Write by, uh, edited by and compiled by Trisha Romano. This one, if you're at all into this kind of thing, you should check it out. It's incredibly fun. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. All right, now is the moment in our podcast when we endorse Dana. What do you have this week? I'm going to endorse a new series on Criterion called Gothic Noir. Is I believe it, it went up in the past month, and so it should be up for another few weeks. I mean, like all Criterion series, this is incredibly well curated. And what's curious about it to me, this is a bunch of noir movies from the 40s and 50s from the UK and from the US. And I've only seen one of them. I mean, not to sort of, you know, vaunt myself as having seen everything because I haven't in the least. But usually if Criterion comes up with some sort of old movie collection, I can sort of look through it and say, oh, this looks unusual. Based on me having seen this other one, well, there's only one movie of the maybe like nine in this collection that I've seen, which is Fritz Long's Ministry of Fear. Great movie. But all the movies, if you've seen that movie, have that kind of feel. You know, they're, they're, um, well, gothic noir is a good word for it. They're sort of not crime movies, maybe set in some sort of lurid melodrama type setting, lots of fog machines, which noir movies often use to hide the fact that the sets were so cheap, <laughs> and uh, and that kind of general mood. Also, a noir movie with Lucille Ball called Lourdes, <laughs> very interesting casting. Um, Kiss the Blood Off My Hands is the title <laughs> of one of these movies, <laughs> starring Burt Lancaster and Joan Fontaine. That looks very juicy. Anyway, I found myself scrolling through it thinking, I want to see every single one of these movies. And I know it always happens to me that I find out about some great Criterion series like the day before it's going to leave and I have time to only watch one movie. So get on there, put your movies in your in your watch list and grab some gothic noir from Criterion. Dana, that sounds amazing. Julia, what uh, what do you have? You know, we all like to complain about the algorithm that's listening to us and it recommends bicycle helmets when you talk about bicycle helmets and etc. But sometimes the algorithm does you right. And that happened to me on Instagram a couple months ago, when for some reason, Instagram suggested that I would like songs by the singer Inji. And I went down a rabbit hole of songs by a singer named Inji who makes sort of, they would not be strut inappropriate. They're like, clever lyric club tracks, basically. And as that might suggest, uh, my favorite of these songs is a song called Uns Uns, which is a <laughs> rye club track about being the annoying girls who harass the DJ to try to get him to play the song that they want to hear. I- 
I swear, it's on the tip of my tongue. I heard it outside the club when we went out for a cig yesterday. And somehow puts you in full protagonistic sympathy with those drunk girls. You could play it again? Cause what you playing ain't it. So skip that shit. All I wanna hear is. And it's got kind of like spoken lyrics. And I, in the manner of the algorithm, I've just been super enjoying the song for a couple months. Did not bother to look anything up about Inji, having done a, you know, 15 second dollop of research prior to this endorsement. I can tell you that she's Turkish born and based in uh, Philadelphia. So anyway, this song is hilarious. If that sounds like something you will enjoy, you will enjoy it. If it sounds like a nightmare, meh, don't click. I, all I can think about is how is ns, ns, ns spelled. <laughs> <laughs> it's U-N-T-Z space U-N-T-Z, but I believe in all caps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay, well, the, the next portion of the endorsement segment is Bitter, sweet, putting the bitter in bittersweet. We're being joined by our producer, Cameron Drews, who uh, has just immediately slotted into the Pantheon, the Producer Hall of Fame for the Gab Fest. It was a great run, Cameron, but you're you're moving on to, let's just say, other pastures, but you, you're joining us for an endorsement. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me on. Yeah. It, should have happened sooner. Any final, like, valedictory words you want to say? Well, I wanted to pick an endorsement that allows me to fold in some of those words. I, I think I've told you this separately, but the, the thing that has really stuck with me working on this show that has changed my life for the foreseeable future is I've developed a taste for watching lots of movies, like lots and lots of movies, especially in movie theaters, you know, I see one Personal or victory. two movies a week in the theater. <laughs> and so, like, the thing that has allowed me to do that and the thing I want to endorse is movie theater subscription services. So just like any situation where you can pay a monthly fee and you can see, uh, you know, the the one that I have is through the Alamo Draft House. I pay $30 or so a month and I can see one movie a day. So, you know, if I see four movies a month or something then i'm paying way less per movie than i would otherwise but i think i think there are other theater chains that have things like that i think amc has stuff like that they have stubs i'm always hearing about it and i've never there you go for it. yeah cameron i can't believe this is like the ultimate slate jam you're coming in after marvelously dexterously talentedly producing us for all these years we were so fortunate to get to work with you and excited for you to explore your greener pastures although we will miss you but you're like coming in here with the ultimate slate pitch and your final go and telling people that they should subscribe to movie pass yeah, I know. <laughs> well uh, yeah i know movie pass actually a great business idea i love yeah, it yeah 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 <laughs> i i mean i will forever remember the year of movie pass which was probably or years maybe 2017 2018 i think that is when I first started seeing a lot of movies in the theater. I started going to movies alone a lot more often. That is that is when I, I got my first little taste of what it's like to to just decide on a whim to see a movie like three times a week. But yeah, I, I'm I don't know what the state of movie pass the actual company is right now. Like maybe stay away from them. I don't know. But if you can sort of replicate that experience somehow, it's pretty good. I probably should do it based on the frequency of my movie going, but the problem is that the logistics of Los Angeles are such that pledging my allegiance to any one house wouldn't work for me. It's like the timing and the location and the traffic. It's like I got to spread my wealth among the Regals and the AMCs. And the okay, AMC would be the one, I guess, now that Arclight is dead. Every so often you got to throw a Lemley in there. It's, uh, it's tough out here. I understand not wanting to stick to just one theater. I, I am lucky in New York with the Alamo Draft House because they also play older movies and stuff. So like there's really a wide variety to choose from. If I lived near the, the Alamo Draft House here, I would I would certainly have to think about it. Um, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your next assignment? You have, it's exciting. Yeah. So, I, well, I'm still working on the working podcast. So that, that part of my job has stayed the same. But uh, in addition, I'll be joining the Death, Sex, and Money team 
for listeners who don't know, Death, Sex, and Money was a WNYC podcast that uh, Slate recently acquired. And they're, they're, the tagline of the podcast is uh, things we think about a lot uh, but need to talk about more or something like that. I think I got that right. Um, it's been really fun so far. Uh, new episodes will start rolling out in April. So I'm just getting to know the team. I'm sort of uh, chipping away at some episode ideas, doing a lot of like pre-interviews with um, interview subjects and stuff. It's been really fun. I'm excited to be a part of that team. All right. Well, we are thrilled to have Jared Downing. As our producer You're in going good hands. forward, so this is no shade to him at all, sincerely. But we 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 really loved working with you. It was a total pleasure in every possible way, and they are so lucky to have you at Sex, Death, and Money. So mazel to them and to you. And please let's stay in touch. Absolutely. All right. Thanks for everything. All right. My endorsement, very quickly, is uh, I think it may have been even been the algorithm, Julia, that handed me a cover of Wish You Were Here, the Pink Floyd song. It's the only Floyd song I can listen to from beginning to end. I just can't stand their whole vibe, but these guys do a great version of it. It's by the Milk Carton Kids. So you think you can tell Heaven from hell Blue skies from pain No sense of the scope of their success so far but they're a folk duo originally from california but i think kind of now associated maybe with nashville or the country scene a little bit sort of old-timey it's folk with elements of old-timey in it like one of them occasionally picks up a banjo But they, they do close harmonies. And the thing is, there are a lot of people in this space, as it were, young people as they are included, but they their songwriting is really strong. That was the thing that surprised me as I branched out from that amazing cover. And so I'm endor- just going to endorse your gateway to these guys, which is a, a video we're going to link to because there are a bunch of live performances of it. But it's this one in particular, the Milk Carton Kids, these two young guys, one with a banjo and like reedy and as tall as the clouds and um the other one just a kind of low-key exuberantly funny guy with an acoustic guitar and the two of them are sort of stage bantering while the guitarist is tuning retuning his guitar i think you're a great banjo player you want to put yourself down yeah and then you piled on like you did to them It's emotional whiplash. <laughs> well, we just had to have some fun because you were talking for so long. And, so, so <laughs> and the banter is so fucking charming. You can't, it's, it's like, I just want time to re- be rewound to the Big Bang. And like some butterfly effect makes me him. You know, the, the, the tall one. He's just so tall and skinny and his hair is a he's got amazing hair and it's like i don't you know I, I don't know they're just they do not ooze vanity even though they're just so lovely and funny and then they play this song called all of the time in the world to kill which is just it's just a superb piece of song craft we're all in the way I would love it if you, if you're going to seek this out, find this particular version on YouTube. We will have a link to it, so you should be able to find it. But it's worth it because you get the flavor of of their personalities in a larger sense and they banter with the audience and the audience is so into it so lovely really wonderful a kind of a low-key electric moment i think you'll dig it anyway cameron again man thanks for everything of course thank you all it's been fun yeah it was, it was a real gas uh, good luck and, and don't be a stranger thanks dana thanks to you thanks a lot julia You'll find links to some of the things we talked about today at our show page, that's slate.com slash culturefest, and you can email us at culturefest at slate.com. Our introductory music is by the composer Nicholas Bertel. 
Our producer is Jared Downing. Our production assistant is Kat Hong. For Dana Stevens and Julia Turner and Cameron Drews, I'm Stephen Metcalf. Thanks so much for joining us. We will see you soon. Bye.